Hello, everybody, and welcome to part five of the mystery demo tutorial series. My name is Jason, also known as Pirate JC, and if you've been following along in the series, you know that we are going step by step, each part of the way, diving deep to build a demo together, except I'm not telling you what it is that we're building. Along the way, you're just having to come along for the ride and find out as we go. In the last video, which if you haven't seen, check out the link down in the description below, we covered how to add variation to all of our waves, right? To all of our Gerstner waves. And I'm incredibly excited to tell you that today we are going to be done with waves. That's right, we're moving on with the rest of the demo. And in this one, there's a moment of pure magic that I cannot wait for you to see. So without any further delay, let's dive right on in. If you're following along from the last one with the link down in the description below, you'll notice this amazing node tree with tons of complex math to bring an amazing pattern to life. Now, we're actually only seeing one uh, here currently. Uh, that's this last one that's toggled on. So let's very, very quickly toggle on the rest of them so that we can kind of see the result of where we uh, have left off, the result of all of this math together. And again, I'm just going through and finding the toggles, which are right below the colored modifier blocks here, and I'm switching those toggles on. Very, very easy, very, very quick. And there we go. That's an amazing, amazing thing happening, an amazing pattern without a ton of repeatability, a lot of variation driving Gerstner waves and being added together. That's really awesome. So here's what we're gonna do to bring our vertex shader piece of this demo to a close. We're actually going to add one more final overriding multiplier to be able to control the resolution of all of these different waves. So a, an overriding uh, parameter for everything, uh, not individual. This will be one that affects the whole entire thing. So what we're gonna grab is we're gonna grab two divide nodes. Let's bring those on in here. One and two. And we're now going to grab a float value. And this float, we're going to give this a name of resolution. And I do, I do want to uh, set it to be available, visible in the inspector. I do not want to give it a group name. That's something I do not want to do. And we'll give it a default value of one. And what we're going to do is we're going to connect this to the right inputs for both the divide nodes. The lerp node we're gonna drag out here from the um, wave, this is our uh, wavelength modification, our wavelength modifier. So we grab the lerp node and drag it to the left input of the top divide node. And then we grab the multiply output and go into the left input of this divide here on the bottom. And so then what we're going to do, I'm actually going to take this overriding multiplier here and I'm just gonna drag it all the way up here because that's something that's gonna kind of symbol it's above visually everything else. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to control click to select multiples. I'm gonna copy and I'm gonna paste new ones for each one of these waves. Okay, it doesn't really matter exactly where it's put right now. We're gonna come back and adjust all these. Okay, so now you'll notice that what we're gonna have to do is start by connecting the lerps for each wave. So that lerp goes there and this multiply goes here, okay? And then what I wanna do is actually close this frame up. I'm gonna close it. And the reason for that is so that I can more easily find the input. So I'm gonna take this top divide node and replace the input for the wavelength. That's where the previous modifier was going. And then this one is gonna replace the speed, okay? so. Those are right under this vector two, it's right and right, and uh, the top one is wavelength and the bottom one is for uh, speed. Uh, and then what I wanna do is I wanna open it back up and I wanna take the divide nodes, I'm holding down control, click and drag to get multiples. Let's try that again, there we go. And I'm gonna drag those into our Gerstner wave one and close it back up. So now these divide nodes are a part of that uh, that wave. So we'll take this lerp, that's gonna go into the left one here. The multiply is going into the left of the bottom divide node. Same exact thing, we're gonna close this up. 
And we're doing all of this so that we can have kind of an overriding multiplier to change the resolution of this uh, pattern, this math all up. Okay, so we're gonna do that. Then we'll open it back again, control click and drag, and then put it in here and we'll close up shop one more time. So we're gonna repeat this process. Uh, if you'd like to follow along, please feel free to do so. If you would uh, prefer to stop the video and just do it at your own pace, that's fine as well. We're gonna continue on here. Uh, so you can feel free to skip ahead in the video if you like to catch uh, back up after this part's done. But for now, we'll just keep on going. We're gonna connect that one there. This one is gonna connect in right here. Open it back, control, click and drag, grab these nodes, pop them into our wave, close up shop again. Okay, and we're gonna do it three more times here. So we've got the lerp, we've got the multiply, We'll close it for easy access to all the inputs. The real reason we're doing this here, that easy access I keep talking about is because that wavelength actually feeds several different places inside of our, um, can feed several different places inside of our node tree. But by doing it this way, we don't have to worry about all those connections because we're just using it once. And so we're gonna control, click and drag, bring those up into here, close up shop, and then let's do our last two. This is the last one I think we need to connect the lerp and the multiply. There we go. And close it. Hook it up. Wavelength is here. And our speed goes there. Open it up one more time. Control, click and drag, put them in and close it. Okay, last one. This one is already connected on the input side. So now we just need to connect the outputs of this to the wavelength and speed in this wave. And then we are all done. Control, click and drag, bring them on into here. So that right there, we are done with all of the math for the waves. We're done, that's it. Everything from here is just tweaking in some values, but the setting up the math is done. I do wanna show you real quick that this overriding value here, watch what happens when I change that. We're dividing by this number, so we're gonna increase the resolution of the noise. So I'm gonna set that to two, and there you can see that we've increased all of the noise, basically. Think of it kind of as a subdivision of the noise. Okay, so for now, I'll actually set it back to one. I'll just show you how it works. And this is where we're gonna do something really interesting. We're gonna depart, change course from what we've done. What I'd like to do is I'd like to paint the surface of this, not with a checkerboard, but with very specific colors based on the shape. Specifically, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at the parts of the wave that are changing the most based on its original position and paint those with specific parameters. So here's what we're gonna do. For any area between vertices relative to the pixels on screen, we're gonna sample and see which parts have squeezed together relative to their original position and which parts have stretched apart relative to their original position. And then we're gonna use that to paint it with black and white colors to see what happens. And this is where I promise magic is about to begin. So what let's do first is we're gonna use the derivative node. So the derivative node allows us to help figure out changes based on that squash and stretch that I was talking about. So the top one that we're gonna do is we're gonna use this as the original position, okay? We're gonna find the original um, the original position of each vertice uh, in, in the mesh, excuse me, and then we're gonna connect that on up. So we're looking for the vector three here out of this vector splitter. Okay, we're gonna connect that to the derivative. So this is just the original mesh, pos mesh position, and then it's multiplied in the world matrix to find the world position, and then we're splitting that out and grabbing the X, Y, and Z of that, okay? That's what we're doing with this node. So we'll take this one on back, all the way over here, big journey, and we're gonna put it right on this side over here. Now this one, this is gonna be the new position. So I'm actually gonna grab the vector three out of this merger node 
and I'm gonna put it in the input. So this is the result, the final result of all of the math, right? This is the output of this pattern. What I'm going to do here is we have this vector four connected. I'm actually going to override it with the vector three. We don't care about that fourth channel. Okay. So now we have nothing's changing there. That's totally fine. We now have the derivatives. Okay. So we're going to now grab a length node and that length node, we're going to copy three more times. Okay. So we have four of them. And what we're going to do is just sample the length of the DX and DY for the original positions and the changed positions. So it's gonna look just like this. And then we're gonna multiply those together, okay? We're gonna need two of these, one, two. So it doesn't matter which order here, left and right is totally fine. Just keep it nice and visually organized, just like this. Next, we're gonna grab a divide node and we're looking for the original position. That's the top track. And that's gonna be over the bottom, okay? And then we're going to grab one more multiply node and we're gonna grab a float. Now I know we've gone through this pretty fast. Feel free to rewind and follow along again if you need to. And we're going to connect the divide node in here and connect this to this float. Now this float, we're going to be call, call it caustic power to hint at what's to come. And we're gonna give it a, a minimum value of zero and a maximum value of one to turn it into a slider. And then I would like this to be visible in the inspector, but without a group name similar to our resolution modifier before. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. So we have our vertex shader is ending with these three nodes here. It's actually the final output is here, okay? And we have the fragment output, which is the uh, applying the color to uh, this actual uh, uh, material. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab these and move all three of these up over this direction. And we can actually get rid of the texture and the vector too, and we can put this directly into the RGB channel so they all have the same value and we get pure black. Don't worry, that's to be expected. We take this caustic power value and watch what happens when we slide it up. We get kind of a silky black gray sheet looking thing. And that's pretty cool. So what's happening is we're sampling the area between pixels projected from the difference between vertices. So we take the original position, I know this is hard to follow, the original position of the mesh and we project that to pixels on the screen. And then we're looking at as it squashes relative to its original position and projected into pixels. And as it stretches and we're coloring those accordingly, okay? We're giving white to the color that, uh, that squashes and black to the colors that stretch. And we end up with this pretty cool pattern. But this, this is where the magic happens. Watch this. We're now going to take this node right here we're taking all of that wave math and piping it directly into ch actually the vertex output, right? So we're changing the physical animation of any given vertex. But we actually don't care about that at all. That's right, all that math that we did, we're not gonna use to actually change the shape of the, of the mesh. We're gonna use it for something very, very different. This is one of the most magical things. I cannot wait to share it with you. I'm moving this all the way up back to this original node. Now watch what happens when I take the original vector three and skip all of that math. Are you ready for this? This is magical. Boom! We have a water caustic pattern on a flat plane. Water caustics, of course, is the way that the light reflects and refracts through the water to create that dancing aura of really cool pattern on the bottom of, say, an ocean or a swimming pool. That is pretty amazing. It's magical. We've created caustics. We've spent four videos together coming up with all kinds of crazy math, diving deep into the matrix to pull ourselves back out to create caustics together. And it's looking pretty good. 
except we're gonna do one other thing to really show off just how magical this can truly look. We're gonna move this node back just for visual organization, right back to where it was, right here, and then watch what happens when we go adjust that resolution value over everything. Let's go ahead and zoom in here. We'll go to top down view and let's go change that resolution to two. Boom, a really amazing looking water caustics. Now, clearly we have a little bit of dialing to do to make sure that there's not such straight lines, but this is the beginning of something absolutely amazing. I hope you find this as magical as I do. If you're not surprised, I'm just a wee bit excited about it. And I cannot wait for you to see what happens next. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you haven't already had a chance to do so, check out the other videos in this series. You can find links to them in the description down below, as well as a link to the starting place and ending place for where we stopped, started and stopped in this video. I hope you consider subscribing to this channel if you haven't already done so, so you don't miss any future updates. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.